Hello dear learners, I am Anuradha, welcome you in this session. In the last session we started with the topic heredity and evolution and learned some interesting concept related to heredity. We left with two questions, I hope you all search the answers. The question was, first, if a trait A exists in 10% of a population of an asexually reproducing species and a trait B exists in 60% of the same population, which trait is likely to have arisen earlier? The answer is, trait B is more probable to arise early as this trait has already been existing and replacing in a larger percentage of the population as compared to trait A. Second question was, how does the creation of variation in a species promotes survival? The answer to question is, genetic variations enable the species to better adapt to changes in its environment. Moreover, it is an important force in evolution as it allows the frequency of alleles to increase or decrease through natural selection. These variations will determine the difference between extinction or continuation of the species. So, I hope the answers are clear to you. Now, today we will continue with where we left. So, in this session, you will be able to understand the experiments done by Mandel and rule for the inheritance of traits. Describe various possible outcomes of experiments. Understand the science behind sex determination. So, as we have discussed in the last session, Mandel selected the pea plant for his experiments due to reasons. They are, it is naturally self-pollinating and so it is very easy to raise pure breeding individuals. Second, it has a short lifespan and so it was possible to follow several generations. Third, it is easy to cross pollinate. Fourth, it has deep defined contrasting characters. Fifth, the flowers are bisexual means the female part and the male part both exist in the same flower. So, these characteristics of pea plants was helpful for Mendel. Let us have a look on what he did. Mendel worked with seven characteristics of pea plant, seed shape, round and wrinkled seeds, plant height, tall or short, color of flower, white or violet, pot shape that you also called as chilka and color of pot, flower position. He took pea plants with different characteristics, a tall plant and a short plant, produces progeny from them and calculated the percentage of tall or short progeny. In the first place, there were no halfway characteristics. In this first generation means the outcome after first cross or F1 progeny, no medium height plants. He found all plants were tall. This means that only one of the parental traits was seen, not some mixture of two. So, the next question was, were the tall plants in the F1 generation exactly the same as the tall plants of the parent generation? Mendelian experiments test this by getting both the parental plants and these F1 tall plants to reproduce by self-pollination. Self-pollination is when pollen from the same plants arises at the stigma of a flower. The progeny of the parental plants are of course all tall. However, the second generation or F2, progeny of the F1 tall plants are not all tall. Instead, one quarter of them are short. This indicates that both the tallness and the shortness traits were inherited in the F1 plant, but only the tallness trait was expressed. Thus, two copies of the trait are inherited in each sexually reproducing organism. 
these two may be identical or may be different depending on the percentage. A pattern of inheritance can be worked out with this assumption. Observe in the picture, capital T capital T and capital T small t are tall plants while only small t small t is a short plant. In other words, a single copy of t is enough to make the plant tall while both copies have to be t for the plant to be short. Traits like capital T are called dominant traits while those that behave like small t are called recessive traits that we have discussed in the last session also. Work out which trait would be considered dominant and which one recessive in this figure. Suppose when we plan showing two different characteristics rather than just one are bred with each other, what do the progeny of a tall plant with round seeds and a short plant with wrinkled seeds look like? They are all tall and have round seeds. Tallness and round seeds are thus dominant traits. But what happens when these F1 progeny are used to generate F2 progeny by self-pollination? A Mendelian experiment will find that some F2 progeny are tall with round seeds and some were short plants with wrinkle seeds. However, there would also be some F2 progeny that showed new mixtures. Some of them would be tall but have wrinkle seeds while other would be short but have round seeds. Thus, the tall short trait and the round seeds wrinkle seeds traits are independently inherited. How does the mechanism of heredity work? Cellular DNA is the information source for making proteins in the cell. A section of DNA that provides information for one protein is called the gene. How do proteins control the characteristics that we are discussing here? Let us take the example of tallness as a characteristic. We know that plants have hormones that can trigger growth. Plant height can thus depend on the amount of a particular plant hormone. The amount of the plant hormone made will depend on the efficiency of the process for making it. Consider now an enzyme that is important for the process. If this enzyme works efficiently, a lot of hormone will be made and the plant will be tall. If the gene for the enzyme has alteration that make the enzyme less efficient, the amount of hormone will be less and plant will be short. Thus, genes control characteristics or traits. If the interpretation of Mendelian experiment we have been discussing are correct, then both parents must be contributing equally to the DNA of the progeny during sexual reproduction. We have discussed this issue in the previous chapter also. If both parents can help determine the trait in the progeny, both parents must be contributing a copy of the same gene. This means that each pea plant must have two sets of all genes, one inherited from each parent. For this mechanism to work, each germ cell must have only one gene set. Now, the question is how do germ cells make a single set of genes from the normal two copies that all other cells in the body have? If progeny plants inherited a single whole gene set from each parent, then the experiment cannot work. This is because the two characteristics capital R are for the shape and Y which is for the color would then be linked to each other and cannot be independently inherited. This is explained by the fact that each gene set is present not as a single long thread of DNA but as separate independent pieces each called a chromosome. Thus, each cell will have two copies of each chromosome, one each from the male and female parents. 
every germ cell will take one chromosome from each pair and these may be of either maternal or paternal origin. When two germ cells combine, they will restore the normal number of chromosomes in the progeny, ensuring the stability of the DNA of the species. Such a mechanism of inheritance explains the result of the Mendel experiments and is used by all sexually reproducing organisms. But asexually reproducing organisms also follow the similar rules of inheritance. Let us discuss a very important social issue. In a society, the woman is often blamed and misbehaved for giving birth to a girl child. But what do you think? Is it right? First of all, it is incorrect in itself as both boys and girls are equal. Also, women do not have any role in deciding the sex of their child. It is actually the male whose sperms are responsible. The chromosome decides the fate of sex of the child. So, let's break the myth we heard from years. We have discussed the idea that the two sexes participating in sexual reproduction must be somewhat different from each other for a number of reasons. How is the sex of a newborn individual determined? Different species use very different strategies for this. Some rely entirely on environmental cues. Thus, in some animals, the temperature at which fertilized egg are kept determine whether the animals developing in the egg will be male or female. In other animals, such as snail, individuals can change sex, indicating the sex is not genetically determined. However, in human beings, the sex of the individual is largely genetically determined. In other words, the genes inherited from our parents decide whether we will be boys or girls. But so far we have assumed that similar gene sets are inherited from both parents. If that is the case, how can genetic inheritance determine sex? The explanation lies in the fact that all human chromosomes are not paired. Most human chromosomes have a maternal and paternal copy and we have 22 such pairs. But one pair called the sex chromosome is odd in not always being a perfect pair. Women have a perfect pair of sex chromosomes, both called X. But men have a mismatched pair in which one is a normal sized X while the other is a short one called Y. So women are XX while men are XY. Now can we work out what the inheritance pattern of X and Y will be? As the figure shows, half the children will be boys and half will be girls. All children will inherit an X chromosome from their mother regardless of whether they are boy or girls. Thus, the sex of the children will be determined by what they inherit from their father. A child who inherit an X chromosome from her father will be a girl and one who inherit a Y chromosome from him will be a boy. So with this, we have to pause the session for today. Let's have a quick recap of what we learn. Mendel plays a vital role in study of heredity. Traits are independently inherited. Sex of child is decided by male not by the female. So with this, we will end the session and till the next session, you have to search for the answer to some question. First, how do Mendel's experiment show that traits may be dominant or recessive? Second, how do Mendel's experiments show that the traits are inherited independently? Third, a man with blood group A marries a woman with blood group O and the daughter have blood group O. Is this information enough to tell you which of the trait blood group A or O is dominant? Why or why not? Question number four is, 
how is the sex of the child determined in human beings i hope you will search the answers so keep studying thank you